You are listening to a special preview of the KE Report Weekend Show with your hosts, Corey Fleck and Al Corlin. This preview is brought to you by our friends at GoldEagle.com. To listen to the full two-hour weekend show, please visit www.kereport.com on Saturday morning. Hey, welcome in. You're listening to the weekend edition of the KE Report. We are starting out the show talking about gold. Why are we talking about gold, first of all? Well, basically for the simple reason that gold has been acting very, very positively of late. This past week, it did have a tendency to, oh, for lack of a better term, slack off just a little bit, but nothing serious. We have Dan Oliver with us right now. Dan has a, a keen interest in gold. Dan works in Manhattan. Very, very knowledgeable guy, regular guest on our show. Dan, let's talk about commodities in general first, and let's talk about the role that mainland China is playing in this very important sector. Yeah, well, I mean, I, in, in my view, again, I've been, I've been saying for nine months now that the, where we are now in the macro cycle, I think, is a precise analog to what happened in 29. Maybe the timing isn't perfect, but but the theme's driving it. And what that is is we're coming out of an enormous, enormous credit bubble. And what credit bubbles do is they create overcapacity in uh, long-term projects like steel mills and buildings and that kind of thing. And when you look at the statistics, you know, China has been dominating the industrial commodity space uh, for for a decade or two. I mean, it's just it's just crazy that they, they buy you know fifty percent of this and forty percent of that of the, the whole world market. These things, and they've used them to uh, build cities that no one lives in, uh, to build ships that no one wants, uh, you know, to uh, to build the fourth ring road around the city or or, or the, the third airport. I mean, all, all these projects that really have no value at all. And I think last summer we saw the beginning of the unwind of that economic model. So you know, what's going to happen is that's excess capacity and. The answer is that they're going to dump it on the on the rest of the world. There, there was an incredibly interesting article in the South China Morning Post uh, a few weeks ago, where the fellow said that that um, that, you know, that China shouldn't pay the mistake of uh, for the, the you know bailing out the whole global economy because they invested this to help everyone else out, and that their strategy to to dump their excess capacity on the world would quote deindustrialize uh, most of the world. So I think that's what's happening, and to me again, that's precisely what happened. In, in, in the in the early 30s, is all the excess capacity from all over the world uh, went flooding out, looking for someone to buy it, and and the response was uh, trade barriers. And Smoot Hawley came in to protect American workers, and in my view of the politics in in the U.S. is precisely that. And we we have a populist. Uh, Republican nominee now, and and his primary support is blue collar workers. There's no way that a President Trump would sit by and allow China de- to deindustrialize uh, the world or, or, or America. So I think that's where we're heading, and it's hard to imagine anything more bullish for gold than, than a return of Smoot Hawley and, and, and second and a Greater Depression, which is where we're headed. And, and, and that's what I think is driving gold prices now. I mean, uh, gold's been incredibly strong, uh, and, and the pullbacks have been very well bid, very orderly, and, and more than that, the, the miners have been absolutely berserk, and, and I think the reason for that, again, is that they were so low, first of all, and that you know, a, a, any move higher on a percentage basis was bound to be enormous. Um, but, but you know, generalist funds all of a sudden are moving into the space because they recognize that they need to have some sort of insurance against uh, the collapse of this credit bubble, which is which is in progress, and 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 the, one of the cheapest, most efficient ways to do that is to get into the gold sector, especially the the, the junior gold sector, which is very levered to operation levered to gold prices. So, uh, again, these things have had enormous runs, and and what's even more impressive is, is not that, but is that the pullbacks have been very uh, orderly and, and, and well bid. Um, so I, I you know, I'm extremely bullish on the sector. Does, you know, it's run a long time, I mean, very far, very quickly, and. And uh, perhaps it needs to digest some of those gains. But you know, people thought that uh, a month or two ago and got run over while, while these things kept going higher. So I, I, I think that's a, a dangerous maneuver. I think you know, unless you're close to liquidity flows, like you work at a bank or something and you see what, where the order flow is, I, I think the, the best thing to do is, is to focus on the long game. And the long game is that uh, you know, all of economics and all of you know, political history and, and where we are c- kind of dictates where, where we're going. And as I mentioned, you guys uh, off air, you know, I'm very interested to watch the the, the gold uh, trading around the announcement of the, of the latest Fed, uh, the release of the latest Fed minutes, which of course no one, everyone knew they weren't going to change rates, but uh, the minutes are always to add a sentence or, or subtract a sentence, and people read the tea leaves. And, and what happened was the the, the market kind of hesitated a bit, and then it just blew, you know, it went down and it blew higher, and and that's. What was happening in reverse a few years ago? Every time the Fed would come out with an announcement pro or, or, or negative gold in a macro sense, gold would just plunge uh, because credit was good and everyone was happy and no one wanted to buy gold. Now we're the opposite. So I, I think the Fed 
uh, which perhaps has been in control of events for the last few years, all of a sudden is about to start being controlled by events. And that's a very different uh, scenario and I think a very scary one for the uh, conventional economy, but a very positive one for gold investors. Dan, there's clearly been a investor sentiment change for gold and gold stocks, as you mentioned. But I know you talking with a lot of generalist funds back there in New York, how do you feel when generalist funds get involved in a sector when it is so beat up? Because some of the bulls will say, obviously, it's good having fund money come in because that is big money and you do see the gains. But are these people willing or is the potential there that they clear out of their positions too after they see a little bit of a gain? Oh, I mean, sure. I mean, the, the thing is, when you're looking at price and stocks, you've got to wonder who the marginal buyer is, right? I mean, everyone who is a gold bug has already bought everything they can afford to buy. So they're, they're probably not going to move the market much um, because all their capital is already deployed. And so you have to look for where, where is the new capital going to come from to, to power this this thing higher? And, and right now, the answer is from these generalist funds that you know look around the world and all they see is negative rates. They, they can't invest in bonds. I mean, the stock market looks very toppy and it's very overvalued. And so they, they don't want to do that. They kind of have to because that's what they do. But they, they're looking for alternate places to put their money and, and, and gold is one of them. And so, I, I, yeah, of course, they'll get out when the conditions change. But I, I don't I don't see where those conditions are going to change in, in the near future until you know, gold is very, very much higher than, than it is now. Dan, let's get back into what China has been doing and the connection that you made to 1929. China has been, you could say, stockpiling, accumulating a ton of commodities. And if they do flood the market with, let's say, steel or a number of these other commodities, wouldn't that drive down price, obviously drive jobs out of the U.S. in terms of manufacturing, but lead to almost a deflationary period, do you think? Oh well, I mean, sh- sure. I mean, in, in terms of the value of those things, I mean, I mean I, again, I've read articles about uh, how in China they they go to shut down the steel mine, and literally the workers rise up and lynch the manager. Now, you know, they, they, this is their jobs, and, and the local guys have a really hard time shutting these things down. So it's not so much the commodities, the warehouse thing, is in warehouse somewhere. It's it's that the capacity to take those commodities and produce steel and and inputs like that that. They're having a hard time shutting down uh, because you know, the, the Communist Party, above all else, values social stability. And so uh, you know, that, that's what they don't want to do. And, and you know, the I- irony, of course, is that China, for the last few years, um, was trying to escape from the trap they set for themselves. So they had all these dollars in, in their reserves uh, you know, for trade reasons. And they were deploring them to buy mines in Africa and all sorts of things. And, and all that was doing was doubling down the economic model. I mean, you know, the commodities only have value to the extent that the credit bubble keeps going, uh, and so to, to redeploy your assets into commodities is sort of probably the worst thing that you could possibly do. So I, I think that's right. I mean, and, and I think when when the market does uh, weaken more, then they'll lose their jobs. But but be be careful about you know words like deflation and inflation. I mean, you can have a situation like in the seventies, like in Weimar Germany, uh, where you have industrial demand collapsing, and so the real value of commodities goes down. But the paper currency is collapsing even faster, and so nominal prices go up. And so, you know, it, there are two different things happening. And, and again, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, that the the world is going to build uh, the China specific, specifically is going to build more of these empty cities going forward. And so, it's hard to imagine where the marginal demand for this capacity is going to come from. In a real basis, it's not hard to imagine prices going up if if currencies start collapsing. On that note, Dan, we have to take a quick break, but we are bringing you back on next segment, and we're going to get into a little more of what a Trump presidency could look like in terms of economic policies and for a number of the manufacturing workers, plus the comments on credit bubbles. How's it going to look? How's it going to be different from earlier in our lifetime, even compared to 2008? So everybody stick around. We're going to be right back with Dan Oliver. 